Hello lovelies, trying something a bit new, though I'm finding the whole chalkboard thing uh, has unlocked some sort of core memory of sitting in primary school class looking at the chalked in date on the blackboard and mentally willing it to move towards the next holiday, <laughs> so, hmm. Uh, housekeeping then, the work on the house is nearly done so videos should return more to normal from next week um, though people did just give me a bunch of extra questions for uh, for role for insight so I might have to look at that a bit more and so you might get a few more of those but then hopefully we'll be back to normal um, got a couple of new books uh, to look at and then obviously I have plenty of old books to look at as well um, which is the more the, the know your role type thing sort of review slash retrospective on stuff um, I hear Venger is leaving the industry which means more money for the likes of me <laughs> I guess um, I don't know that I don't know that we have much of a crossover audience, to be honest. Uh, some people, perhaps. It's still a shame to see someone uh, leave whoever they are. Um, Tvenger is, at the heart of it all, a nice guy, really. A, a normal guy. Uh, regardless of being a lol cow and everything else. So... I hope the, the focus on his family and everything else, I hope that goes a lot better for him. Um, some of the reasons he gives include that things are things are harder in the industry. He's not making as much money as he used to. Um, you know, And that is a problem when you turn your hobby into a business. And it can be disheartening when people aren't necessarily picking up what you're putting down. Uh, it has been rough. I have opened my own web store, which has helped somewhat. I sell quite a bit through Lulu. Um, I have my other side projects and things, and I've done other work for other people. That's been stressful because of the work on the house and needing to pay for that. But yeah, it, it gets to be more and more of a struggle every year. And it is hard <laughs> when you see other people that aren't necessarily uh, as deserving, perhaps you might say, as other people, um, you're doing well. Um, I, I feel that on behalf of other people as much or more than I do feel it myself. So I don't think it's just jealousy because I, I feel for other people who I think are far better game designers and so on who aren't doing so well in this in this current landscape um and so it it's a shame it's a shame when anyone gives up uh off the back of that as well inappropriate characters is stopping you know i used to be on the show back in the day um got all the shit for it <laughs> left uh because of the covid stance of, of pundit and uh, to a less degree venger um yeah, again, that's that's bittersweet. Seeing people give up is disappointing. Um, even if I disagreed with them, you know, a lot of people gave me a lot of shit for being on it in the first place, but I felt that having a different perspective on things there was was useful, you know, politically, socially, whatever else. I was the I was the Fox News liberal on there, whatever you want to call it. Um, and I think losing that dynamic kind of created problems for the show. Um, you know, the final decision was mine, but I'd be lying if it wasn't that certain people were making it intolerable <laughs> uh, even to, to keep going on it because a lot of assumptions were made about me because I was. Um, yeah, that was difficult. But again, that's um, disappointing to see it go. Which brings me on to a broader sort of topic, I think. You know, um, I'm on I'm on the path to recovering from the right-wing 
cancellation that I got. But I dropped in on one of the Basic Experts streams uh, the other day. And there was a lot of negativity towards me in the chat there. Um, yeah, a lot of hostility. And this is a trend I'm seeing everywhere. I mean, the stream that I was in was the basic expert getting into a slap fight with with pundit. You know, fisking one of his one of his videos or e fapping. I guess the kids are calling it these days, but I know it is fisking. You're know, going through it step by step, and you know, right of reply and all that. Yeah, but everyone is so nasty <laughs> to each other at the moment. Um, even amongst the kind of people who used to be unified and nasty to other people. And I think the problem that I've had with both the activist types and the reactionary types is, is the nastiness, actually, thinking about it. You can disagree without having to slide into nasty behaviors or accusations um, going after people's families or their heritage or flinging around words like fascist or or Marxist willy-nilly as if those words don't actually mean anything, which they have ended up not meaning anything because people overuse them. Uh, I know some guy got nailed to a tree about 2,000 years ago for, for suggesting this, but like, can't we all just be a little bit nicer to each other? <laughs> please. Uh, you will note how I am putting this message out on a comments video that lots of people don't watch. So I'm sure it'll be very, very effective. All right. I don't have a lot of comments um, this time. Maybe it's because contentious people have, have buggered off. I don't, I don't know. Um, but yeah, I want to devote most of the time to revisiting the AI art argument because I think we have to keep coming back to it because I feel like we're thrashing something out and week by week, month by month, the the argument progresses perhaps perhaps a little bit. But it's the fanat as I've said before, it's the fanatics on either side that push me in the opposite direction because I guess that's just the way I'm wired. But um, firstly, though, um, Paul Berry asked, "Ye gods, who's been passed around the most? Star Wars, Star Trek, or Marvel?" It seems like a new RPG publisher got a turn with these annually. Yeah, it's a lot. So I, I didn't cheat. I've gone by memory. So when it comes to Marvel, you had the TSR edition. You had the Saga edition with the cards. You had a relatively obscure Diceless Marvel Superheroes RPG. You had the Margaret Weiss Productions RPG Marvel um, and you've had the current edition. I think that's all of them. So that's what, one, two, three, four, that's five have done Marvel superheroes. Um, when it comes to Star Wars, we had the West End Games edition. We had the D20 edition. I think technically we had two D20 editions. Um, and we have the Fantasy Flight edition. I think think that's it so that's that's three there may be a, i've got a niggling feeling there's another one that i'm forgetting but i think that's three then when it comes to star trek we had the fasa star trek game we had the last unicorn games star trek game which was very very good uh, and we have the modifius and i think that's it so i think that's all the star trek ones so so the winner uh, by a clear margin, is Marvel Superheroes. Uh, Marvel Superheroes is the is the drunk party girl of, of intellectual properties. <laughs> um, why is that though? Something to do with the the licensing regime or how comics and RPGs intersect? I would imagine that in the past, at least. Star Wars was pretty serious about its licensing. You know, Lucasfilm was pretty serious about its licensing because that's where Lucas made all of his money. Star Trek, I think there was a huge dry spell where we didn't have 
much in the way of Star Trek material out there. So while it's fans of Fanatical, I don't think that was the customer base. So maybe that explains why. Marvel are just whores. <laughs> um, so the only other thing I want to talk about from the comments is the AI art issue. So Lanessa8008 had a fairly lengthy comment Um but it's worth going through, I think, because they have relevant expertise on kind of both sides of the coin. Um, and then I want to talk about, off the back of that, some of the extra things that have gone on. Uh, so Lanessa says, we're not really talking about AI, we're talking large language models. Uh, and These things are not going to get exponentially better. We've hit a cap, you'll see this in five years, because the code cannot be currently improved. I work in this field and the tech bros are lying slash misrepresenting what AI could be soon. So yeah, the, about the large language model thing and it not really being AI, uh, I concur, I agree, but everyone's calling it AI, right? It's like meme doesn't mean a, a cat picture with text on it. Right? It's meant to be a, a unit of information analogous to a gene, but you know that ship has sailed. So I think we're going to have to be less precious about the term AI, unfortunately, but that's that's how language works. Um, yeah, it may not be getting exponentially better, and sometimes they make tweaks and it makes things worse, but there is a progression from when this first kind of hit the scene to where it is now. Um, and we have different competing models, and we have AI LLM, altering its own parameters so um, I think we've hit a soft cap not a hard cap um, and then like, much like AI output itself it's now iterative and it will it will still get better and the point is that right now is the worst it will ever be right so it's always going to get better and more effective and more cost effective over time which I think is what might actually nip it in the bud a little bit um, but as he says, I digress. The subject of the hand is more nuanced than most discussions. So to preface, he says, I'm an artist, but only in physical mediums. I trained in Zurich under a well-known artist there during the 90s. And while I see the value of AI art, I'm definitely not a fan from an aesthetic viewpoint. Okay, I, me, Grimm, editorializing there somewhat. Prompting is itself a skill. Now, it's it's laughable to compare that to the actual skill of putting something together artistically but getting a decent output from an AI is a matter of progressively refining your prompts learning the quirks of the system uh, giving it stylistic hints and so on and then going through an iterative process where you gradually refine the image it's like sculpting in a way, you're gradually getting the prompt closer and closer to something that will output something that you want, right? So um, the aesthetic of it, there is a kind of generic AI aesthetic, but if you know what you're doing using it, you can avoid that and you can produce something with a particular style and emphasis, um, though it does have trouble with really strong styles, which is somewhere I think real artists can kind of still get an edge um, so that that's that's one thing um, that makes it less of a threat I think to, to artists and writers if you have a really strong personal style it's very hard for the AI to imitate that or copy that effectively there is a generic AI slop aesthetic uh, but they're kind of already was <laughs> for a lot of commercial art and uh, and trends shift it, it is even it's even a recognizable aesthetic where someone has just put in a generic prompt they get a generic output and and there you go but it's also possible for people to produce material with a very distinctive style either by training their own model on their own influences not unlike learning how to paint and draw yourself you might say, um, but you know, you look at something like Elf King, and their artwork definitely has that prog rock album cover, 
1970s paper tiger fantasy art book sort of sort of feel to it they've very successfully customized their prompts trained their ai whichever it is to produce material that evokes that aesthetic and that time period that they're after and it doesn't look like generic ai slop so i think that there is a there is a skill there and there is an aesthetic judgment that is made and there is even artistic input on the part of the prompter saying this is what i want this is the style i want it in and then accepting or rejecting the output and then possibly going on to tweak it or whatever uh in photoshop or whatever else on the other end all right back to lenasa uh, that being said Let's take a digital artist using Photoshop. Almost all of their workflow, even before AI, was automated tools and programs which automatically created effects that they wanted to create. One could in good faith argue that this was 50% machine art and not real art as well. You didn't have to learn how to use a specific medium, watercolor, oil, acrylic, pencil. So the real change here with AI is that we just took the human creative step out and had the computer do the art for us with text prompts. It's the same fucking tool generating the visuals though. We just don't click the drop down buttons and move the mouse around. Going back to real artists who do these things by hand, that's thousands of hours of learned experience and skill being replaced by a drop down menu. So my question for the subject generally is where is the line? Because all of the arguments I've heard from the Luddite faction could equally be applied to digital artists using computer programs. Where were you in the 90s and 2000s decrying bullshit computer art? Um, to which I say, hey, I'm old enough to remember that when Photoshop kind of progressed beyond being simply a, a, a tool for graphic designers and more general awareness of it popped up, um, everyone was saying exactly the same thing. You know, this is, this is bullshit. This is not proper art. Um, this has been shooped. I, I can tell... <laughs> from some pixels, <laughs> you know, all that, that old meme, all of that. So there was this reaction before. Is this different? Yeah and no. Um, you know, even a crude Photoshop takes some sort of personal skill and investment, I guess, whereas this doesn't necessarily beyond learning how to prompt um, and exercising discernment o over the output. So... I think the argument is is progressing. I'm doing some A-B testing where I've got a product with an AI produced cover and I've got a new product coming out very soon uh, with a human artist produced cover and I'm going to cross compare them one against the other and see if it makes any difference whatsoever. Uh, beyond artistic and aesthetic concerns there are some other concerns which I think are more valid. AI art has democratized art. It has made it accessible to people um, in a way that only rich furries could afford <laughs> in the past. All right, so anybody can come up with an idea, ask an AI to, to turn it into something tangible almost. Uh, and, and have it happen. Now that's hugely liberating for a lot of people and so the anarchist in me is pleased, nay chuffed, that lots of people can now produce artistic materials. All right, there's a, a flip side to that. We can compare it to social media in that that democratized people's ability to communicate with large numbers of people in a way that previously only mass media could do. And again, the anarchist in me loves that, right? Anybody can put out anything. It's like the um, episode of The Simpsons where Lisa puts out her own newspaper because Monty Burns has bought up everything else. And then everyone starts producing their own newspaper, right? Great. However, that does allow for misinformation and nastiness and all kinds of other horrible things to happen. So there's a dark side to that which I have to wrestle with ideologically as an anarchist and that we all have to wrestle with in terms of our, our daily lives. I mean, look at the, the riots and so on recently. 
The other aspect to this is the monetization, right? In many ways, the argument is facile and stupid because every artist is influenced by other artists and AI is influenced by artists. You know, your work goes in one end, it becomes part of the, the, the algorithms and the programming and influences what comes out the other end. But that is true of all artists. Now, it's not quite the same as being inspired by or loving the work of somebody else and incorporating that into your process. But at the same time, it kind of is. Um, and there's no hard and fast line we can draw here other than to say somehow, for some reason, art that doesn't have more human input than commissioning, <laughs> essentially, um, is somehow not art, not worthwhile, um, not useful. Uh, so, or to be just prejudiced against machine-produced art of all kinds. I don't think that's a viable position. But artists feel that they should be rewarded for their material being used in these AI art programs um, or server farms or whatever you want to call them. Um, and I can understand that argument. At the same time, it's pretty much impossible to enforce because it's, a, it's very definitely a mistake when an AI program essentially reproduces what you've done or your style very, very closely. And that's going to disappear slowly over time. I don't know whether these lawsuits are going to go very far, but at the moment it basically means legally that any AI-produced art is public domain. Uh, which, again, as an anarchist, I can appreciate, right? Uh, people try to sell it, but you, you are legally in the right if you just blag it. So yeah, there's there's those there's those things as well. Currently, I think it's very useful as a former creative director, art director. It's very useful for very rapidly getting quick filler illustrations that you might need, or filling in a gap where you can't find an artist. And I've had very negative experiences recently trying to hire artists uh, to the point where I almost don't want to try anymore because it's such a minefield of scammers and flakes and it's just horrendous. But then on the other side, I've recently been recommissioning uh, one of the old human artists that, uh, that I work with and there's a very nice feeling that goes with interacting with them, paying them. They're, I'm grateful to get the art, they're grateful for the work. You know, there, there's a nice aspect to that when you know you're dealing with someone who isn't trying to rip you off and isn't going to vanish into the ether. That's that's nice. You know, I always used to do open calls or hunt down people who were artists but having problems making rent or whatever because I wanted to use my money and my effort to, to help people. Um, and that's a nice feeling that you can't get from AI. But AI art, in a pinch... <sighs> Right, Venger's just left the industry, making less money. Margins are extremely tight. Um, it's very difficult to make money in this industry unless you have a very successful Kickstarter project or whatever. And that tends to go to the blandest, most generic bullshit you've ever seen. So, you know, we're in a, between a rock and a hard place, all of us, artists, writers, game designers. As usual, the RPG industry is at the kind of bleeding edge of all this stuff. And so we need to continue having these discussions. But the trouble is the people that seem to be most invested in the conversation are not people like me who are trying to figure out how all this is going to work, but they're people who are either evangelically for AI art or evangelically against AI art, and neither of those positions is going to end up being what happens, and neither of those positions is tenable any more than the anti-Photoshop stance was in the past, saying. Imagination is a deeply personal game about depression and its effects, intended to help people with invisible illnesses to broach the subject and explore it in a way in which they can have power over it. Imagination is set after the fall of mainland Britain to a strange reality breakdown 
the barriers between imagination and reality, dreams and nightmares, have shattered, and strange things dreamed up by people caught in the event team across the land. Only those whose minds are already broken can hope to cope with exploring, understanding, and combating this strangeness for the sake of the huddled refugees that sit and wait and watch from the smaller islands around the coast. A game of mental illness and art using the description system as used in Neverwhere. This game is available free, so please promote, download, host and spread as far and wide as you can. Available at post-mort.com and drive through RPG. Are you strong? Are you strong? 